It's Tuesday, September 8, 2020, just after market close in New York. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington in New York, joined shortly by Jared Dillian, editor of the Daily Dirt Nap. But first, with the day's stories, Jack Farley. Thanks, Ash. The sell-off in tech continued today, with the Nasdaq bleeding as much as 4.4%. This marks the biggest three-day decline since early March. The S&P and the Dow are following suit, albeit less dramatically. The dollar extended its rally, as did U.S. Treasuries, so the money is going somewhere. The question on everyone's mind is, what's causing this sell-off? Obviously, there are concerns about rich valuations and a fragile recovery, but what I want to focus on is the action in the derivatives market. Call option volume has just been exploding since early August, and this was attributed to retail froth, you know, the Robin Hood crowd. But on Friday, the FT dropped a bombshell that SoftBank has been buying billions of dollars worth of calls. And the author ascribed the sort of weird spot-up volop phenomenon that foreshadowed the sell-off to SoftBank. And they also implied that SoftBank was sort of the reason that the market was going haywire. But some quants are saying not so fast. Ben Eifert of QBR Advisors argues that the bulk of the bets SoftBank made were delta neutral, meaning that they were buying call options, or in this case, call spreads, and simultaneously selling underlying stock in order to hedge exposure to price swings in that underlying stock. Eifert says that these trades are all about vega, or exposure to changes in implied volatility rather than exposure to delta, which is exposure to changes in the underlying price. So look, it's very hard to parse the institutional footprint from the retail footprint, harder than you might imagine. I'm actually going to be speaking to Jason Buck later today. Hopefully, he can help me separate the signal from the noise. And in other news, there's a glut of credit that's set to be issued this week. With the lull of August officially behind us, over $50 billion of investment-grade bonds are set to be priced in North America just this week. Up to 45 deals are actually set to be inked just today. Nestle, Valero, MetLife, Kimberly Clark are all tapping the debt markets uh, even as credit risk rises. How the stock market panic will affect trader confidence remains to be seen. And with that, let's go over to Ash and Jared Dillian. Jared, thanks for joining us. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Jared, is this your first time on RBDB on the Daily Briefing? It is my first time on the Daily Briefing, yeah. <laughs> and we were, we were just on last week, uh, you and me and uh, Dave Floyd and Tom Thornton talking uh, in real time during the Festival of Learning. Yeah, that was a good discussion. And we're probably going to cover some of that today, too. Yep. Yes, I imagine there'll be some similar ground to be covered. Markets have not calmed down since then. Talking of which, let's just read through major indices down today. Dow Jones Industrial Average closes at 27,561, down just over 2%. S&P 500 down to the 3331 level, 3331. Uh, down 2.78% on the day, off almost 100 points. NASDAQ closes at 10,847, down 4.11% on the day, off 465 points. Yeah, I mean, it's um, <laughs> this is short gamma hell, is what we used to call it on the trading desk uh, back at Lehman Brothers. Um, we had, gosh, um, a ton of people buying upside calls, very short maturity. Uh, and the gamma worked on the way up, and the gamma is now working on the way down. Yeah. Jared, for those who aren't as familiar as you are with gamma, with some of these options plays, give us a context for what that means. Well, first of all, I just want to I want to point out that, you know, when I started in the business, I started in 1999, and I was uh, a clerk on the Peacoast Options Exchange. And back then, there were four options exchanges. There were the Peacoast, there was the Philly, there was the Amex, and there was a SIBO. Now there's like 15 different electronic exchanges. Back then, in 1999, the consolidated option volume in any given day averaged around 2 million contracts. Now the consolidated option volume is about 45 million contracts. And if you think about this, each contract is 100 shares of stock. That's controlling 4.5 billion shares of stock per day. So the derivatives market has gotten large enough that it's it's the tail that's wagging the dog. Right. Now, I'm curious, Jared, that is a relative growth of the options market that outstripped the pace uh, of the traditional uh, of cash market trade volume. Is that right? So in other words, it's rising on a relative basis as well oh, as yeah. an absolute basis. Yeah. yeah. For, for, you know, for stock volume has been 
kind of flat over the last 20 years. It's up, you know, slightly, but nowhere near the growth of the options market. Yeah. So what does that mean to you? Uh, and how would you explain that to people who haven't had the experience like you have of being on a major bank trading floor uh, pre, uh, you know, pre um, regulation? Well, I mean, if you think about what's happened in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, there's been tr some charts sent around. Uh, Sentiment Trader had a, had a really interesting chart showing the explosion of call volume in the last couple of months. And it, all the all these retail investors and SoftBank is part of this, but yeah. SoftBank is really only about ten percent of the volume that's been happening. Okay, so a lot of people say SoftBank is the whale; they push the market higher. It's actually just a small percentage of it. So when you have people buying short dated options less than a month to go until expiration, there that these are options with the most gamma, and this is the change in delta with with the change of spot. And this this reflects hedging in the options market. So if the if the investor community is net buyers of options, then the dealer community is net sellers of options and they're short gamma, which means they have to buy stock on the way up and they have to sell stock on the way down. And that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. So it becomes kind of a feedback loop. Oh, absolutely. And you have, you know, alternatively, when you have periods of low volatility, when the investor community is selling options, then what happens is the dealer community is long gamma and they sell on the way up and they buy on the way down, which actually compresses volatility. Now volatility is expanding. Right. So what does that mean for the overall shape of this market and how you think about it? Well, this will the volatility will die down probably after September expiration. It's not going to go back to normal levels, but it will probably die down a bit. Implied vol right now, the VIX closed uh, at 31, spot 41 on the day, up 2%. Yeah. And if you think about this, it, you know, historically, this has a lot of similarities to, to the dot com bubble back in 1999. Um, these are two instances in history where volatility went up when spot went up. And that's not usually what happens. Usually when the stock market goes up, volatility compresses. Right. This time it actually expanded. And it reflects the amount of speculation that's going on in the market. Yeah, and particularly uh, on the derivative side, I would imagine. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, I certainly didn't call any of this price action. Uh, with the benefit of about a week of hindsight, and you look at that explosion in option activity, it's, 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 a, it's clearer with a little bit of hindsight that that was probably the top or something close to a top, I like to say that you, you usually don't make V tops, right? You make V bottoms, but you don't make V tops. And topping isn't a moment, it's a process, and it takes a long time. And I do expect that we're going to rally significantly, but like back up to the highs. But I think that the top might actually have been put in. Yeah. I'm also curious, I mentioned the regulatory component at the banks. Now, back in the day when you were at Lehman Brothers, obviously it was pre-Dodd-Frank, uh, so you had prop desks that were able to step in and buy on the banks uh, uh, for the bank's account. Does that uh, break of decelerating volatility by having uh, more broker-dealers who are able to uh, support prices uh, or uh, tamp them down when they get out of control have an impact on the volatility? Um, actually, I don't think so. I mean, if, if you go back, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I think that, um, you know, the prop activity uh, at the banks on the equity derivative side was actually pretty small. And mm -hmm. even in the Dodd-Frank world, equity derivatives market makers have had a lot of latitude to put on offsetting trades. They made the argument that they can place hedging trades whether those trades are hedging or prop is a matter of some debate, but right. they've, still, they've still continued to trade actively, even under Dodd-Frank. So with the discussion about volatility as prologue, what's your current outlook on U.S. equity markets? Um, you know, I'm less certain about whether we've just put in a top. I'm less certain about overall direction. What I am pretty, pretty certain about is that we might have made the turn in the growth versus value trade. Uh, that has persisted for the last 10 or 12 years, the growth outperformance over value. Um, you know, I, I think in this environment, I don't like shorting. I don't like shorting much at all. 
I'm not a big short seller. Uh, and I think in environments like this where, you know, where you have tech cratering, it's easier to find stuff to buy than it is to find stuff to sell. And I'm looking at value stocks that have just been given up for debt. You know, for example, the whole brick and mortar retail sector is of interest to me. Uh, energy is of interest to me. Basic materials is of interest to me. If you think about energy and basic materials combined, they make up less than 5% of the S&P 500 in terms of market cap. And that's the type of stuff you usually only see at extremes. So that's the type of stuff I'm interested in. Yeah, that's really interesting to me, actually. You know, the the idea, uh, and, and why don't we set up a little bit for people who don't follow this uh, as closely as you do as well, uh, the context of where we've been for the last, uh, you know, many number of years, at least, uh, on the uh, relative outperformance of growth stocks versus value stocks. And then we can lead the conversation in a little bit more to the specifics about what you see going forward. Well, you know, back in 2018, uh, I actually was going through my old newsletters recently, and I saw in one of my newsletters, this was in 2018, I said, the outperformance of growth versus value is unsustainable. <laughs> this was in 2018. And the thing with these style box trades, whether it's growth versus value or large cap versus small cap, they just they trend for a really, really long time. They right. can trend for over a decade. You know, and I, like I said, was, you know, it, it takes some hubris to call a turning point in this growth versus value trade. But this implosion that we've seen in growth, I think, is a major turning point. So how do you know then, Jared? What do you look for? Are you looking straight at the tape, just looking at the price action? Or are there other indicators that clue you in that we may be for a regime shift uh, in terms of uh, these kinds of trades? Well, I look at everything in terms of sentiment, OK? And you know you can look at sentiment in quantitative ways. You can look at the option volume that we talked about. You can look at the explosion in call option activity, the number of Robinhood accounts that have been opened. These Robinhood accounts aren't trading energy and basic materials. So <laughs> you, you can look at those sorts of things, but you can also look at uh, more softer things. You know, you talk to people you talk to on the street. What stocks are they trading? What are they interested in? You know, and this varies over time. I mean, back in 2003 and 2004, the hot stocks were steel stocks and copper stocks and stuff like that because the dollar was falling and we had this big basic materials trade. That's not what's going on right now. Yeah. I would imagine copper stocks now COA are not big players right now on the Robinhood trade. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you think about this, and you, you made this point uh, that these that these regimes can be durable, they can look uh, out of balance for a very long time before they shift. How do you know when it's ready uh, to start thinking about actually committing to trading? Well, you can't, uh, you can't do it ahead of the turn. You have to wait until the actual turn. So mm -hmm. now that we've seen the turn, I think it is safe to start putting on some of these spread trades. I mean, if you wanted to take... Um, you know, S&P value versus S&P growth. So I, IVE versus, I think it's IVW is growth. And you just wanted to buy IVE and short IVW and put that on for 10 years. I think that would be a pretty good trade. We've seen the turn. I have comfortable putting on that trade right now. It would have been insanity to put it on a month ago. So let's talk a little bit about how you do it. Do you typically do it in exchange traded products? Do you look for uh, representative uh, stocks to make that trade? How do you look at that in terms of selecting the securities? I look at representative stocks. Uh, you know, to to buy and sell sector or style ETFs, it you know it takes up a lot of capital. Uh, yeah. that's, that's the type of trade you could do at a bank or a hedge fund. But if you have a personal account, uh, those those types of trades eat up a lot of margin. So then it's a matter of looking for the stocks to buy. Now, I, you know, I have some stocks that I'm looking at. I'm, I don't want to share them here, um, right. but, but it's, all, it's all stuff that we talked about. It's brick and mortar retail, it's energy, it's basic materials, stuff like that. Yeah. So without talking about the stocks themselves, talk a little bit about the process that you use to select it at a high level. Um, when you see the process, what do you mean? Like, like, how do you think about that when you go and you, you select the names? Like, what's your process that feeds into that? What do you look for and why? Uh, I look for the types of trades that if you talked about, if you talked about them on Fast Money on CNBC, you would get thrown off the set, right? <laughs> like, <you> know, <laughs> like, if you brought up like Abercrombie and Fitch, 
on on you know on fast money on cnbc they would just throw you off the set i mean it's so out of consensus it is such an insane trade you know right. that that's you know that those are the types of contrarianism trades that are, are going to work in this environment Jared, well, what what's your time horizon typically look like on these trades in other words how long do you like to stay in these trades for uh for me it's uh it's it's six to twelve months at a minimum uh, sometimes multiple years. You know, I'm a very, I'm a very, that's my style. I'm a very long-term trader. I don't trade in terms of days or weeks. It's months or years. Uh, very interesting. And how did you, how did you find, this is something that I've always been curious about. How did you find that particular style? How did you get into a place where you thought, yeah, I don't want to be trading the day-to-day -day, uh, noise. I'm looking for something that's a, you know, a 12 month or a longer trade to be in. I don't know. That's always it's always been what I've done. You know, when I was at Lehman Brothers, this is obviously pre Dodd Frank. Uh, I had a pretty big prop book on the ETF desk, and you know, at working working at a bank, I mean, I had the ability to make short term trades, day trades, in and out. Uh, but you know, when I constructed that portfolio, that was those were the type of trades that I was doing. I was holding them for the long term. Very interesting. Let's shift gears here a little bit and talk about fixed income. What are you seeing? What's your take on the bond market right now? Uh, you know, we had a bull flattening today. You know, it's risk off, so bonds rallied. And what does that mean for people who aren't uh, who aren't fixed income folks? Tell us about what bull flattening trades mean. Okay, so a flattening is when the spread between short term interest rates and long term interest rates goes down. OK, a steepening is when the spread between short term interest rates and long term interest rates go up. Now, these trades are also directional. A bull flattening trade is when the spread between short term interest rates and long term interest rates go down. But on an absolute basis, yields on both of them go down. So you can have a bull flattening, a bear flattening, a bull steepening or a bear steepening. There's four ways that you can transpose the curve. Right. So in this particular circumstance, tell us what you're seeing right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, long-term rates came down a lot. Um, there's, it's, it's just a classic risk-off trade. Uh, you know, the the sort of background here is that we have de facto yield curve control. Okay, like the Fed has basically jawboned interest rates lower, and um, you know, there's there, there's a limit as to how high they can go, and there's a you know, there's theoretically no limit as to how low they can go. But you know, I, really, rates are kind of in a range here. There's just nothing very exciting about it. So, from your perspective, how do you think about term structure? What is the key benchmark do you look at? Do you look at tens minus twos? Do you look all the way at the thirty-year uh, end of the curve? How do you think about it? And what are the key references that you use? Well, for most of my career, I looked at twos, tens. I looked at the spread between twos and tens, and that was basically the benchmark for curve trades. And now that we're doing this sort of de facto yield curve control and short term rates are very low out to about five years. If you want to look at the curve, you really have to look at fives, thirties. Mm. Uh, you know, I've looked at tens, thirties a lot in my career. Tens, thirties is a pretty good measure of long term inflation expectations. So if you look at a chart of tens, thirties over the last six months, it's actually widened significantly. That's a pretty good sign of inflation expectations. But right now, I'd be looking at five thirties. Yeah, it's interesting. I think a lot of the main investing websites don't even have ten thirty as a as a sort of a benchmark index that they that they put out. Most of the conversation happens uh, about around twos tens. So it's interesting to see that uh, with some of the um, you know monetary policy causing action at the short end of the curve, that you've actually shifted your time horizon further out toward the long side of the curve. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, now we have 20s, too, which complicates things even more. So, Yeah. So let's uh, switch gears again and talk a little bit about the currency market. What are your thoughts on the dollar right now? Uh, you know, I think the dollar's consolidating. Uh, there's a lot of dollar bulls. They're very vocal. Um, they think that, uh, I mean, obviously, the dollar is going higher. Um, you know, there was sort of a, we, we touched 120 and backed off. The ECB meeting is Thursday. There's sort of some chatter about how, you know, there's a couple of possibilities. The ECB might increase quantitative easing or they might actually jawbone the euro lower. You know, I mean, basically, it's in this environment. Uh, it's really it's tough for any currency to appreciate significantly. Nobody wants a stronger currency. 
Right. So it, it is possible that they talk down the euro a little bit. But ultimately, if you look at the delta of monetary policy, the U.S. has a much more aggressive easing policy than the ECB does. And unless the ECB eases more significantly, it's going to be tough for the dollar to rally. So honestly, I think this range that we're in from about 118 to 120 is in consolidation. And I think the dollar will continue to sell off in about three to six months. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious, do you think, uh, are you looking at, are you looking at uh, DXY as well, which obviously has a significant weighting toward the euro? Yeah, I look at DXY. I also look at BBDXY, the Bloomberg index. But a lot of times I don't even have that up on my screen. On my screen, I, I just have the euro. So I yeah. use it as a proxy. Jared, we were talking off camera a little bit about Canada, not a topic that frequently comes up. What are your thoughts there? I've been, you know, I've been following Canada since 2013. And, uh, you know, I was, I was in the housing short trade, which didn't work out, but, you know, I, I was mostly unharmed. So it's, you know, whatever, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, Canada is getting interesting right about now. First of all, the Canadian dollar has strengthened significantly. Uh, over the last couple months, it gapped out to 146. Dollar CAD gapped out to 146 in the beginning of the crisis, and it strengthened all the way to 131. Um, and this is sort of juxtaposed with, you know, Justin Trudeau is about to propose. I mean, already Canada has about a 300, 200, 300 billion dollar deficit. He's about to propose the biggest social spending program in the history of Canada which is going to explode the deficit. Part of that is universal basic income. And Canada, nobody's talking about this, but Canada is really going to be sort of an experiment for basic income financed by MMT. Like that is going to be happening in Canada. And the politics around this are amazing. I mean, Trudeau has, you know, he's survived every scandal known to mankind. He survived the blackface scandal. He survived SNC Lavalin. He survived We Company, and I think the Canadians at this point are just very cynical about this. I mean, there's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of corruption in his administration. You have a new conservative leader. His name is Aaron O'Toole. Uh, he took over for Andrew Scheer. Um, so, I, you know, it's going to be interesting. There might he might Trudeau might call an election in the next couple of months. So things are going to get very interesting in Canada. So, what's your outlook there? Are you looking at the currency? Or are you looking at Canadian equities? Well, I'm looking. I'm looking at the currency. I think it has the potential to weaken significantly. I and mean, when I see dollar CAD at 131, in the context of what's going to happen on the fiscal side, uh, that's that seems to be mispriced to me. Uh, I I think the Canadian dollar should weaken significantly. The rates market is also kind of interesting because um, you know Canada has been downgraded. They were triple A. They've been downgraded to double A. They're probably going to be downgraded further, and this might put some pressure on the rates market. It's from a macro standpoint, this could turn out to be a really big trade. All right, Jared, I've got to ask you, one of the most surreal trades of the year, Tesla. Started out uh, the year trading around 85 bucks, ran up to about 500 uh, at the beginning of September, now down to 330. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I have, a, I have a lot of thoughts. First of all, you know, for disclosure, I, I was a Tesla shareholder in 2013. Uh, I made some money on it. And then I was short Tesla in 2019. And I basically scratched that trade. I, you know, I was flat. Um, you know, the history of this is if you go back, I mean, you said Tesla was at 85. So, you know, pre split around 180 or something like that. When Tesla was trading at 180, I mean, the whole Tesla short community was rejoicing. You know, they were they were very vocal shorts. And then of course the stock went from 180 to 2000, it was a thousand percent squeeze. I mean, one of the, one of the most incredible things I've I've seen of all time. Uh, I'm a little I think the timing of the Tesla secondary is a little suspicious. Um, that they 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 did this shelf offering basically the I don't know if it was the day or two days before that Tesla was not included in the S&P. And if you recall, the whole run-up was on speculation that they would be included in the S&P and it would be this big index ad. So the timing it, it, the timing is almost too good to be true to me. And of course, Tesla's traded off about 30 or 40% since then. Yeah, talk a little bit about the significance of the shelf offering. 
Well, you know, I mean, from Tesla's standpoint, it was the smartest thing they can do. You know, they were the biggest car company in the world, but they weren't a very well capitalized car company. And they were able to raise five billion dollars. Honestly, they should have made it bigger. They should have raised 10, 15, 20 billion dollars. But even with five billion dollars, they have enough cash to keep them going for a long time. So, you know, all these all these trades that people had on Tesla bankruptcy, stuff like that, like that doesn't work. They're, you know, they have cash for the next couple of years. I mean, there's a saying on Wall Street, feed the ducks when they're quacking. You know, the du- the ducks were quacking and they stuffed the ducks with five billion dollars worth of stock. So yeah, one would think that would be disconcerting to the Tesla Qs, but I'm not sure that they've been dissuaded. <laughs> I don't think there's anything that would dissuade them. I have, I have no dog in the fight. I don't, I don't have a position in the stock. Uh, I just, what I find interesting about Tesla is that you get these extremes in sentiment. You know, yeah. you, you get very, very like extreme bearish sentiment. You get extreme bullish sentiment. And you know, as a company. There's, you know, from the fundamentals, there's not a lot to go on. There's no earnings. It's hard to value. And it's one of those stocks that's hopes and dreams, you know, and it's very difficult to be short hopes and dreams. Well, it's a great story. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic story. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see uh, on what time horizon the story converges with the stock price. <laughs> I'm not, I am not getting involved. It's too dangerous for me. <laughs> An important point. Jared, final thoughts. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I, I think one of the one other thing that people aren't really talking about, you know, everybody has sort of blamed this tech implosion for the price action in the market. You know, one of the things I've been saying for months is that political risk at some point would started to get priced in. And I think that it's, I think it's, yes, I think it's a tech implosion, but I think you're starting to see the beginning of political risk get priced in. So, you know, we didn't talk about the election and we probably shouldn't, but I think that's kind of creeping into the markets. I want to avoid conversations about the election as long as I possibly can until at least October. Yep. (laughs) Jared, thanks for joining us. Lots of information there. You'll have to come back and do this again. Yes. Thank you.